on World News Tonight. Roe revives. India reignites the role of a Sikh separatist leaders killing by grilling Canada for more information. Presidential treatment. Striking United Auto Workers get the presidential treatment as Biden and Trump visit Michigan. Holy Braille. A new tablet brings hope to the blind as it assists the visually impaired to enjoy tactile graphics. And Alaskan Aurora. Nature puts on a spectacular show in the skies above the US. is Adha Derana World News Tonight, reporting from Colombo. Here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening. This is World News Tonight. We have an expansive coverage for you and today we begin in India. India's Foreign Minister S. Jai Shankar stated that India is open to looking into any specific information Canada provides on the killing of a Sikh separatist leader in Canada. Tensions flared up after Canada recently said it was investigating credible allegations linking the Indian state with the murder. India dismissed the claim as absurd. Hardeep Singh Nijar was shot dead outside a temple in British Columbia in June. He had been designated a terrorist by India in 2020, an allegation his supporters vehemently deny. The Indian government has often reacted sharply to demands by Sikh separatists in Western countries for Khalistan or a separate Sikh homeland. The Khalistan movement peaked in India in the 1980s with a violent insurgency centered in Sikh majority Punjab state. It was quelled by force and has little resonance in India now, but is still popular among some in the Sikh diaspora in countries such as Canada, Australia and the UK. Meanwhile, the Foreign Minister added that India had given Canada a lot of information about organized crime and leadership relating to recessionist forces operating out of the country. The U.S. government shutdown is just days away. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy called on President Joe Biden to agree to tight border restrictions in order to prevent wide swaths of the U.S. government from shutting down for the fourth time in a decade. As the clock ticked down to a nearing deadline that could force wide swaths of the U.S. government to shut down, the House and Senate appeared far apart in the high-stakes spending battle. Republican House Speaker Kevin McCarthy, who was trying to hold off a rebellion by hardline members of his own caucus, called on President Joe Biden to agree to tighter border restrictions in order to prevent a shutdown, a proposal that was not likely to resolve the stalemate over government funding. Over in the Senate, Democratic leader Chuck Schumer said a bipartisan group of senators were on the verge of unveiling a stopgap funding bill to avert a shutdown on October 1st. And he criticized McCarthy's plan to push ahead with four full-year spending bills that reflect conservative priorities and stand no chance of becoming law. Speaker McCarthy, instead of focusing on bipartisanship, catered to the hard right and has nothing, nothing to show for it. And now the Speaker will put on the floor hard right appropriation bills that have nothing to do with avoiding a shutdown. Hardline House Republicans have voiced opposition to the Senate's bill. McCarthy, meanwhile, is readying a stopgap spending bill that would restart construction of the U.S.-Mexico border wall, a signature policy of former President Donald Trump, and would tighten immigration policies, which are certain to be rejected by Biden and the Senate. If the two sides don't reach an agreement, hundreds of thousands of federal workers will be furloughed, and a wide range of services from economic data releases to nutrition benefits will be suspended beginning on Sunday. Over in France now, consumers are grappling with skyrocketing inflation, with some consumers taking extreme measures by buying fewer personal hygiene and household products. French consumers are buying fewer personal hygiene and household products as prices surge. The change in shoppers' habits could become a new battleground for retailers, politicians and consumer goods makers. The data was compiled by consumer buying experts Nielsen IQ. It showed overall sales volumes for shower gel and tampons fell in the year ended September 17th. Dishwashing products, laundry detergent and toilet paper also sold less. Supermarket prices for items in each category were sharply higher so far this month compared to the same period last year. President Emmanuel Macron's government is due to address grocery inflation in its budget on Wednesday. 
It's expected to announce the legislation to bring forward annual negotiations between food producers and supermarkets. It hopes price cuts can then take effect from January rather than March 1st as usual. Supermarkets and politicians have criticised major food makers like Nestle and PepsiCo for not cooperating in pricing talks and for reducing pack sizes of products. Leading French supermarket Carrefour put labels on products that are getting smaller with no price cuts last week. Major brands like Aerial Laundry Detergent and Dove Soaps have dominated the market over retailers' private label goods. But the Nielsen IQ data showed volumes for private label personal products are slowly going up. Shower gel volumes fell by a tenth for big brands but rose 14% for private label products. Unilever declined to comment and Procter & Gamble did not respond to a request for comment for this story. Ukraine's special forces said they had killed Moscow's top admiral in Crimea in a missile attack. The target of the attack was the headquarters of Russia's Black Sea Fleet in the Crimean port of Sevastopol. According to a report, Russia has neither confirmed nor denied the death of the Black Sea Fleet commander. Ukraine's special forces claimed on Monday they had killed the commander of Russia's Black Sea Fleet during an attack last week on the fleet's headquarters in the Crimean port of Sevastopol. The Russian Defense Ministry did not immediately confirm or deny whether Admiral Viktor Sokolov had been killed in the attack. A video shows Friday's attack. The Ukrainian military said it was targeting a meeting of the Russian Navy's leadership in Crimea, which Russia seized and annexed in 2014. On the Telegram messaging app, Ukraine's special forces said, quote, after the strike on the headquarters of the Russian Black Sea Fleet, 34 officers died, including the commander of the Russian Black Sea Fleet. Another 105 occupiers were wounded. The headquarters building cannot be restored. Satellite images from Friday showed smoke billowing from the building in Sevastopol's city centre. It was not immediately clear how Ukraine's forces counted the dead and wounded in the attack. Both sides have at times inflated claims of enemy losses since Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine in early 2022. Russian installed Crimean officials confirmed the Ukrainian attack on Friday, saying at least one missile struck the fleet headquarters. Kyiv has stepped up attacks in the Black Sea and Crimea as Ukrainian forces press on with a nearly four-month-old counteroffensive to take back Russian-occupied territory. President Joe Biden joined the ongoing labor strikes by the United Auto Workers in Michigan, marking a first-of-its-kind moment for a sitting president that shows the White House embarking on offense against his likely 2024 opponent, former President Trump. U.S. President Joe Biden joined the picket line with striking auto workers outside a General Motors plant near Detroit Tuesday and backed their demand for a 40 percent pay increase. You guys, the UAW, you saved the automobile industry back in 2008 and before. Made a lot of sacrifices, gave up a lot, and the companies were in trouble. But now they're doing incredibly well. And guess what? You should be doing incredibly well, too. Flanked by Secret Service agents, Biden exchanged fist bumps and took selfies with the crowd after he spoke. UAW workers this month began targeted strikes against GM, Ford and Chrysler parent Stellantis, seeking wage increases to match CEO pay jumps, shorter work weeks and job security as the industry moves toward electric vehicles. Biden's appearance here comes one day before his leading challenger, former President Donald Trump, is scheduled to address workers at a nearby auto parts supplier. Republicans believe Biden's push to electrify America's vehicle fleet by pumping billions of dollars of tax rebates into EV manufacturing is unpopular with auto workers. In a statement on Tuesday, Trump accused Biden of stabbing auto workers in the back, claiming Biden's EV mandate will annihilate the U.S. auto industry and cost thousands of auto workers their jobs. Biden, though, was joined on his visit by the head of the United Auto Workers Union, Sean Fain. And so today I just want to take a moment to stand with all of you, with our president, and say thank you to the president.
The appreciation only goes so far, and UAW has declined to support either 2024 presidential candidate, making it the only union not to back Biden. Both candidates are expected to sharpen their 2024 campaign message in Michigan, a state which helped propel Trump to the White House in 2016 and then helped Biden win in 2020. Union voters are seen as key to victory here. While only about 10% of U.S. workers were union members in 2022, they have outsized political influence because the states where they are strong, like Michigan, often swing from voting Democratic to Republican, and their grassroots networks are powerful influences on the working class vote. Welcome back. The federal government of Australia has announced that Sydney's nuclear reactor in Lucas Heights is set to receive a multi-million dollar upgrade. It's capable of transforming the aging facility into a top-of-the-range medicine manufacturing site. It's Australia's only nuclear reactor producing nuclear medicines that save lives every day. Being able to have a facility like this in this nation uh, that can deliver cutting-edge medicines, this is a big deal for the country. Nuclear material from Ansto's 40-year-old reactor moves to a processing facility where the isotopes pass through various stages to become purer, more stable and safe for around 12,000 medical procedures a week, most often scans for various cancers. The final stage of turning those isotopes into a medical product and distributing them to hospitals within 24 hours now happens in a 50-year-old facility coming to the end of its life. It's well and truly due for an upgrade so that we can ensure uh, that we can produce out of here uh, innovative nuclear medicines for decades to come. That means committing to a new facility to be designed and built by the mid-2030s and while no cost has been put on it, it could well be hundreds of millions of dollars. The old facility has become plagued by safety breaches, including in 2017 when a worker suffered radiation burns. It's a fundamental uh, that we manage this facility in a way that uh, is safe, reliable and efficient for Australia uh, and make sure that we get those medicines out to the people that need them. And now we have some good news for you. An innovative new device is set on revolutionising learning for the blind. Monarch Display Tablet now enables standard Braille and typography on the same surface. Today is the best time to be a blind person in the world. Greg Stilson is a project manager at the federally funded organization American Printing House, which is about to unveil a piece of technology they call revolutionary. The Monarch Display is a tool that provides both standard braille and tactile graphics on the same surface. The Monarch could drastically improve the way people who are blind, especially students, can learn. For starters, it displays 10 lines of braille at once, while most electronic readers only can handle one. You cannot read like that. And this is the big upgrade. The Monarch can also present graphics and charts in full, not line by line like many readers today. I mean, imagine trying to solve a graphing equation like that. I'd have to remember all the changes that I need to make to the current equation, as well as the line above it. Not to mention, the Monarch can also store multiple textbooks, which you don't think about. But take a look at just how big one Braille textbook is when printed out and stacked. I think that's more than most backpacks will accommodate. That's APH VP of Government Relations Paul Schroeder testifying before a Congress subcommittee back in March. They're trying to secure more funding because this item is going to cost thousands of dollars when it finally hits the market, and they want to make sure it gets into classrooms. Blind students are resilient. And we have, and I say we because I was a blind student, we have had to learn many times without sufficient materials. APH says the Monarch should be available sometime next year, but for now, at least there's hope for students like Arushi that technology is going to finally catch up just in time for college. I've heard from many visually impaired people who have been to college that it takes sometimes like a quarter, a whole entire quarter for you to get your textbooks in Braille. That's why I'm really excited for this. North Korea's ambassador to the UN slammed South Korea and the US for provocations. The North Korean envoy also justified its nuclear and missile development, claiming it was done for self-defense. Addressing the UN General Assembly in New York, 
North Korea's ambassador to the United Nations, Kim Sung, said Tuesday that the regime blames both South Korea and the U.S. for attributing to the current dangerous situation, slamming the allies' continuous moves to bolster deterrence against evolving North Korean threats. And due to threats posed by Seoul and Washington, Kim says North Korea is accelerating the building up of its self-defense capabilities, going as far as to say that the Korean peninsula faces the immediate danger of nuclear war. The ambassador also noted that both South Korea and the U.S. had made what he called hysterical remarks of confrontation with phrases such as end of the regime and occupation of Pyongyang, which he says is in flagrant violation of the principles and purposes of the U.N. Charter. Meanwhile, South Korea's deputy permanent representative to the U.N. Kim Sang-jin slammed the North's ambassador for making groundless, illogical and absurd allegations. He questioned how many countries would actually believe North Korea's allegations, adding that their claims that South Korea and the U.S. are provoking the tension on the Korean peninsula are untrue and absolutely incorrect. In the meantime, South Korea's ambassador to the United States said Tuesday that the apparent strengthening of cooperation between Pyongyang and Moscow is most concerning, adding that Seoul and Washington will not sit idly by. Ambassador Choi Yan-dong made the remarks amid growing concerns following the Kim Jong-un Vladimir Putin summit in Russia that has sparked speculation that the two countries may be on the brink of an arms deal. Cho pointed out that an arms deal would allow Russia to secure military supplies in its war in Ukraine, while the North is seeking technology to address failures in satellite launches earlier this year. Moving on now to a historic trial. For the first time, many countries will have to defend themselves in front of a court in the world. Six young people from Portugal will take on 32 countries in the European Court of Human Rights for failing to protect them against climate change. These siblings from Portugal are taking 32 countries to court. They're part of a group of climate activists age 11 to 24 who are finally presenting a landmark case before the European Court of Human Rights, accusing states of failing to do enough to protect them from climate change. Sofia was only 12 when she decided to take action. What I feel most is frustration in the face of the inaction of governments. They say it's a secondary concern instead of making it a priority. Protecting the planet is as important as protecting the economy. It's all linked. The move was sparked by the wildfires that devastated Portugal in the summer of 2017, killing more than 100 people. The six young activists accused the 27 European member states, as well as Russia, Turkey, Switzerland, Norway and the UK, of not sufficiently limiting their greenhouse gas emissions and that the consequences are affecting their living conditions and health. There has been cases taken by young people about climate change in other courts around the world before, um, but this is the first case to be filed with the European Court of Human Rights and it's the uh, first case to be heard by the court uh, relating to the rights of young people. All they want is governments to do what is necessary to safeguard their futures. More than 80 lawyers are expected in court to represent the accused countries. But before looking at the case itself, the court will need to decide on whether it's admissible. Climate litigation has been growing in recent years, both in Europe and beyond. Currently, about 3,000 climate-related lawsuits against governments or companies are underway. Welcome back. Now, Thai residents waded through flooded streets in Bangkok. For more on that story and much more, let's take you around the world in a minute. Thai residents waded through flood water at Bangkok street market as cars struggled to navigate flooded roads. As hunger and exhausted army and families continue jamming roads while fleeing their homes in Argono Karabakh, the Azeri president has said there will be no further military action in the breakaway enclave. Hollywood writers will go back to their jobs as their union struck a tentative deal with major studios. The actors' union, which is still picketing, hopes the agreement will pave way for them as well. The body of Italian mafia boss Matteo Messina Denaro was returned to the Sicilian hometown of Castel Vetrano. The world's first food made from plastic waste is vanilla ice cream. The developer hopes that it kickstarts a heated debate about the future of food and plastic pollution crisis. And that is all we have for you on World News Tonight. If you missed any of today's programs, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash other there in English. We're leaving you tonight in the USA as Northern Lights shone across the sky in Alaska. Thank you for watching. Have a great night.